class is now in session. I am Professor Hockey, and today we'll be previewing the 2023 free agency cycle for the San Jose Sharks. Now, usually I'd have this video after the draft, but the draft is actually very close to the opening of free agency draft taking place on the 28th and 29th of June, while free agency still opens on the 1st of July. So there would only be a couple of days time to get this video out. So I've decided instead to have it before the draft, which is in a couple of days from now, and then have my draft preview after that, or uh, my draft review after that, and then eventually a free agency review after that first day passes. So in this free agency preview, we will be discussing exactly how the San Jose Sharks cap situation were, will work out going into next year, and actually it is looking quite favorable. The Sharks have moved on from many of their bigger contracts. Uh, Brent Burns was traded to the Hurricanes last offseason. Timo Meyer was traded to the New Jersey Devils at the deadline, so he no, no, no longer needs a huge contract, which means the Sharks have a ton of cap space to play with. However, it's not as though the Sharks are a super heavily competing team, which means this cap space is not going to be used to sign any big players in free agency most likely, but is instead going to be weaponized in a way to try and get some assets from teams that are indeed up against the cap and looking to shed some salary where they can. And the Sharks can easily pick up one or two players who have some sizable contracts and just fit them into their team just quite seamlessly. As we can see here, their cap hit currently, thanks to all the players that they have signed, plus the dead cap that they have, which includes the Martin Jones buyout, the Rudolph Spalsers buyout, and of course the salary retained from the Brent Burns trade, they've got $69.4 million of a cap hit, which with the $1 million raise to the cap ceiling this year, gives them $14.1 million in terms of cap space. And this is involving nine forwards, eight defensemen, and one goaltender. It should be noted that this is only including the nine forwards that were on the roster by the end of last season, which means this is Couture, LeBanc, Hurdle, Barabanov, Nico Sturm, Steven Lorenz, Oscar Lindblom, Luke Cunnan, and William Eklund. This is not including players like Bordalo or like Daniil Gushin, who are technically signed to contracts and could very easily play for the San Jose Sharks next season. So even though it does say nine forwards, they have the capability of having at least a couple more of them. Having said that, they're obviously going to be looking to re-sign some of their restricted free agents to fill out the rest of this forward core, and that's where we get to our RFA section. And the first one being Noah Gregor. Gregor was in a pretty much identical situation last offseason because he is an extremely consistent player at being inconsistent. It feels as though half of the games that Gregor's Gregor plays are invisible ones where he doesn't really do much and generally just kind of healthy scratched even in some of them and the other half of the games Gregor is getting tons of great chances and while he's not necessarily burying on all of those great chances the fact that they are being generated in the first place is extremely impressive and so it's very difficult to kind of nail down where exactly Gregor lies you're constantly just in that sim that sim similar situation where you're saying well let's just give him one more chance when does that sort of amount of chances actually run out and you just sort of, sort of give up a bit on Noah Gregor? I'm not entirely sure, but I do feel as though he did enough this past season to warrant at least another chance. Of course, that would likely mean with all the healthy scratches that he got this past season and the fact that he was super inconsistent that he's not going to get a sizable raise and will likely end up just around where his qualifying offer actually is at $1 million. Next on the list is Jacob Peterson, a player picked up sort of innocuously at a last year's trade deadline, but did very, very well in the short stint of games that he had with the San Jose Sharks. And I've made the comparison multiple times between him and Barabanov from a couple of years ago when the Sharks picked up Barabanov at the trade deadline. And so why not give him a comparable contract? Barabanov at the time was given a one-year, $1 million prove-it type of deal. And so Peterson could very easily be given the same thing. There was definitely not enough of a sample size to try and give him an actual sizable contract contract. The Sharks don't want to trap themselves into any sort of thing. And so this prove it type of deal can, like with Barabanov, show whether or not Peterson can keep that up over a full NHL season. And if he can, then the Sharks can go back to the negotiation table and see what they can work out potentially slightly more, at least long term, with him.
Next is Fabian Zetterlin. Now, I'll, you'll see here that I actually have him coming in at slightly higher dollar value than both Gregor and Peterson. And that may come as a surprise because it is no question that both Gregor and Peterson were better than Zetterlin in his time with the San Jose Sharks. However, it should be noted that Although Gregor and Peterson are in this similar camp, but Zetterland has arbitration rights and he has sort of an argument to get at least a bit more money because while he was really bad with the San Jose Sharks, he was actually pretty decent with the New Jersey Devils prior to that Timo Meyer trade, was on pace for a good 35 to 40 points last season, and that likely would have earned him at least a you know two, $2.5 million bridge type of deal with the New Jersey Devils. However, when he got traded to San Jose, he fell off a cliff massively, which you would make him think just be worth like league minimum, but I imagine it'll even out and he'll come in at around 1.25, and the Sharks will absolutely be willing to sign that, mostly because they want to avoid the embarrassment of having specifically targeted Zetterlin in that Meyer trade and then immediately letting him leave after 20 bad games and so generally he should be back and probably come in at around 1.25 still a difficult contract to predict he could very well come in at around that 1 million and he could even potentially get slightly more than this as well because indeed how much is that previous experience with the Devils going to be factored in then when it comes to a couple of these other restricted free agents like Svechnikov and Gajevic both of these players are extremely replaceable if they do get get brought back, which is technically possible. In particular, I would say with Svechnikov, they would likely be brought back at league minimum, but it feels as though it's kind of just time to move on from these couple of players. Svechnikov was nice for the one year he was here. Gadjevich has been here for a couple of years and he was okay, but the Sharks have some younger blood coming into the lineup and you don't really want Svechnikov or Gadjevich standing in their way. So while I definitely don't think they're necessarily completely goners from the San Jose Sharks, because again, Greer can do anything he wants. He is the general manager, but I would feel as though these time these two players have had their time run out here in San Jose. And then finally, the last RFA I'm going to talk about here is actually Martin Kaut, who likely would also be coming in at league minimum, like with Sveshnikov and Gajevic. But while those two, I feel as though could, are easily dispensable type of players, I feel as though Kaut could be given another opportunity here in the very few games that he played last season. He was at the very least somewhat decent. And and as a restricted free agent, you could easily just sort of have him either buried in the minors with the Barracuda if things don't work out with the NHL, but also coming up here every once in a while to get some games to see how he works out. So probably a player who you can give a contract to, but I certainly won't cry if he ends up getting moved on from as well. However, with all of these restricted free agents, even though you can definitely make a 12 forward roster with a couple of extras on top of that, I feel as though Mike Greer, especially with the cap space that the Sharks have, will look to try and pick up one of these veteran type of bottom six players like he just sort of loves and the Sharks have gone for in these past couple of seasons. On top of that, it also makes for decent trade deadline bait. You pick them up essentially for free at free agency and then you can trade them at the deadline for like maybe a sixth round pick or something that is technically just a free asset for yourself. And so taking a look at the unrestricted free agent class, there are some options for those bottom six players. Of course, these are not all of them. This is not an exhaustive list, and it's technically possible that the Sharks either go for someone not on this list or just nobody at all. But here we'll start off with Nick Benino, certainly an option that the Sharks can bring back. The organization is, of course, very familiar with him since he's been with them for the past couple of seasons before being traded at the deadline to the Pittsburgh Penguins. And of course, they also very much love Nick Benino for whatever reason, and he's given decent minion, uh, minutes even if he does come back. So, could be an option. Ryan Reeves as well. I know a lot of Sharks fans obviously aren't a huge fan of Ryan Reeves due to his time with the Vegas Golden Knights, but he does fit the bill as the type of player that Mike Greer would want to get. Bottom six type of guy could get sort of into the scraps, which especially if you're replacing Yona Gajevic could be very helpful for the San Jose Sharks. And then a couple of other players coming in at slightly lower value, maybe around 1 million, would be Cogliano, another former San Jose Shark from a couple of years ago when he was traded to the Avalanche at the trade deadline, as well as Darren Helm, another former Avalanche player. De dealt with some injuries this past season, may want to go with slightly more of a competing team, but also a veteran option for the San Jose Sharks for that 
fourth line. It should be mentioned because a lot of people might be looking at this and saying, well, why would any of these players actually want to sign with the Sharks if they know that they're going to be bad? Well, there are a multitude, multitude of reasons for why that may be. The first one, you'll likely get much more playing time with San Jose than any other team that you might actually sign for. You can sign with a competitive team and hope to get a crack at that Stanley Cup, but let's say you're Nick Benino, you might get like 14-15 minutes of time on ice per night with San Jose, while with another team you could potentially be a healthy scratch, and even if in the lineup, getting like 10 minutes of night on the fourth line. So if you value actually playing the game, you'd probably better off with the Sharks than any other team, or you know, most other teams, I guess you could say. On top of that, the Sharks have the ability to offer more money. A very competitive team will be likely right up against the cap, and if they want to sign Nick Bonino, they're probably saying like, hey, take league minimum, or just sort of we can't sign you, but the Sharks can say, hey, you know what, you want a 1.5, why not? You want two, I guess we could do that as well. It's a situation where the Sharks have a lot more freedom, and if a player wants to get money, this is an obviously solid option for themselves. And then finally, the final reason is these players may not have any other option, especially when it comes to a player like Darren Helm or Andrew Cogliano, players right near the end of their career who aren't necessarily super excitable for some of these contending teams. The San Jose Sharks may very well be one of, if not their only offer this offseason. And if you still want to play hockey, you gotta take what you can get. And so they could very well end up with San Jose. On top of that, it is not just forwards that the Sharks will be looking to address a bit, at least in unrestricted free agency, also goaltenders, which is probably going to be an even greater priority, because with the departure of James Reimer and the fact that the Sharks will not be re-signing him, they only actually have one sort of NHL caliber, although barely NHL caliber, goaltender with Capo Kakinen. And while they could technically bring up, like, Makanyemi to be the backup goaltender, the fact is that the Sharks will probably want, like, more of a 1A, 1B type of situation, because again, Capo Kakinen is not a good goaltender and is Makanyemi really ready for that type of responsibility probably not so the Sharks will likely look for more of a veteran presence in unrestricted free agency there are a few options I've outlined a couple here one of them former Rangers backup goaltender Yaroslav Halak very much near the end of his career but still a decent goaltender uh, will he be able to handle the potential uh, rigorous schedule if he ends up getting like 35-40 games by outperforming Kapokakin, and I'm not entirely sure. That would obviously be a conversation for Mike Greer to have with Halak, but is an option. And then maybe a slightly more viable one, because is more used to the heavier workload and slightly younger, though still rather old, is Cam Talbot. Was a starter with the Edmonton Oilers for a while, and then with the Minnesota Wild, and then last year it was with uh, the Ottawa Senators. If he's willing to take on more of a 1A, 1B, which at this point in his career is probably the best he can get, definitely could come to the San Jose Sharks for a couple of million dollars. And then let us move on to the potential projected lineup for the San Jose Sharks. This is with the signings that I predicted to happen, what they could run. It's not necessarily going to inspire a ton of hope for next season, but is indeed the case here. It should also be noted that this does not include any potential draft pick from this upcoming draft in a couple of days. This is because unless some crazy thing happens that allows the Sharks to pick up either Fantilli or Carlson, who are maybe slightly more NHL ready, the fact is, is that if they take Mishkov, he's committed to the KHL for the next few years and if they take Will Smith he's committed to college for at least the next year so neither player would end up factoring into the team this season as such they are not considered. Let us move on to this lineup, Eklund, Hurdle, and Peterson as that top line, LeBanc, Couture, and Barabanov, then Luke Cunnan with Sturm and Gregor, and finally a fourth line of Lorenz, Lindblom, and Zetterlund, calling in a couple of other sort of potential backup players, that would be Cogliano, who I predicted to be a potential unrestricted free agent signing for the Sharks, and of course Thomas Bordalo. As much as I would love to see Bordalo in the actual starting 12, his short stint at the end of last season did not really inspire a ton of confidence, which means he would need a very, very strong training camp and preseason to actually earn himself a spot in the starting lineup come game one of the regular season. Otherwise, he might just be that 13th forward, but likely more so an AHL option for the San Jose Sharks. When it comes on to the defensive side of things, you'll notice I barely talked about defense in 
either the restricted or unrestricted free agent sections and this is because the Sharks had eight defensemen signed this is the exact same core that they ran with last season which was decent enough of course this is assuming Eric Carlson will be a San Jose Shark at the beginning of next season I don't necessarily believe that to be true but I'm not necessarily going to speculate on if he gets traded because of course any sort of return could come with like a potential cap dump that could really throw a loop into what these free agency plans for the San Jose Sharks are and so for the purpose of this video we will be assuming that he stays which means the pairing will look very much identical to what they were near the end of last season Carlson Thrun, Vlasic Benning, McDonald Ferraro with Shemek as a seventh option as well as Knizhov as an eighth option on top of that and then goaltending wise of course Kakinen and then the aforementioned unrestricted free agent potential signing in Yaroslav Halak or Cam Talbot or even like a Jonathan Quick depending on who the Sharks try to go with there and that will give the Sharks a cap hit of about 75 $5 million dollars leaving them with a cap space of about eight and a half million dollars and that is before any likely like I said any Carlson trade so eight and a half million dollars is a lot to play with if Carlson gets traded that suddenly like almost doubles likely depending on the salary retention that would come with a trade like that which means the Sharks will have tons and tons of options to try and get some contracts from other teams and we shall see what they end up doing but indeed if you take a look at the lineup here that the Sharks will likely be heading into the season with or at least something like this it's not inspiring a ton of confidence and it'll probably end up being yet another rebuilding season for the Sharks class dismissed